Hello, this is a introductory video for the medical genetics section of the Immunity and Multisystem Disorders course. This short video will review some of the material that you should be quite familiar with from first year material. I will give you an overview of how we're going to cover the area of medical genetics over the next three days. Um, in essence, we will cover it from the perspective of the kinds of disorders that uh, represent particular types of genetic mechanisms or genetic inheritance patterns, as this is generally how most of these uh, topics are covered on uh, national boards and national exams. Um, and this will hopefully set you up so that when we start talking in more detail about some of these techniques and uh, concepts and diseases that they'll uh, make a little bit more sense. So uh, learning objectives for this short section, we're going to talk about organization of the human genome. It's important to recognize that about 16 years ago, the first draft sequence of the human genome was generated. And uh, we have learned an awful lot about how the genome controls uh, both human health and disease over the intervening years. Uh, we'll look at the origin of genetic variation in individuals and populations, as this is really what the study of genetics is all about. And then we'll explain how genetic variation can impact um, expression and inheritance of the human genome. And in fact, in the first section, we'll talk about inheritance on the level of chromosomes rather than on the level of genes. So what do you actually need to know in this area? Well, uh, much of what we will cover in this early section is really in the area of molecular genetics, covering what uh, chromosomes look like, uh, what genes look like, how they're regulated, and what alterations in gene sequences might look like and what they might do. Um, I'm assuming that you have a pretty good basis in the general genetic mechanisms of expression and modification of the genome, including replication, transcription, translation, etc. Um, and to think about these in terms of um, the inheritance patterns that are a large part of what we're going to talk about. Um, obviously, one of the most important things about understanding genetics is how we can use this in the cons in the area of clinical diagnosis. So recognizing what are the um, characteristics of individuals with either common or in most cases fairly uncommon genetic disorders because let's face it, most of the Mendelian inherited genetic disorders are pretty rare. So it, it will be important to be able to identify anatomical defects in individuals and then correlate those with what the uh, physiological basis of disease might be. Um, and then uh, the final area that we'll cover is in population genetics, where, for example, in individuals seeking genetic counseling, um, how we can calculate risks of particular disorders showing up in those families. Uh, in terms of recommended readings, there are some fairly clear ways, I think, to do some background reading if you wish. Uh, first aid for the basic sciences, um, that has a, a section just on genetic principles. Uh, fairly short, and so it's important to recognize that in, in general the sort of common genetic uh, mechanisms and concepts we talk about here are not the widest tested uh, area on national tests. Um, this book we used to use, um, it, it is around, um, if it's, uh, it, I, I think you can use it if um, some, of the, some of the topics are not clear from the others. Uh, robins, the big robins, or even the small robins, uh, pathological base of disease has an entire chapter. Uh, and the nice thing there is that you can get that for free through the library. Um, and I've obviously reviewed all of the firecracker content, uh, and I find it to be pretty sufficient for uh, everything that you're going to need to know. Um, so how will this be tested? So um, I try to answer this question. I have spent some time looking at uh, the uh, breadth and depth of the questions on USMLE World. Um, a year ago there was 81 questions. There was actually a few less this year, interestingly. I'm not quite sure why they dropped that. Um, there are 81 questions out of 2,400. So you can see that it's not the hugest topic, um, but it will hopefully get you some points that will uh, get you to where you want to be. Um, 
I've looked through the questions and sort of tried to come up with a, a hierarchy and order of the most commonly tested uh, disorders, and here they are. You can see number one was uh, Down syndrome. There are eight questions. Now, of course, each question will be asking a slightly different um, concept related to Down syndrome. It might be a mechanism, might be about clinical findings, clinical presentations, or inheritance, risk assessment, etc. Uh, you can see some of the other cystic fibrosis, which is the most common uh, autosomal recessive disorder, a, a, chro a sex chromosome defect seen in females called Turner syndrome. Um, we see mitochondrial disorders, triple, uh, triple, triplet expansion disorders, fragile X and Huntington, and some less commonly tested. So, in, in essence, what this means is you don't have to know a whole variety of different uh, disorders to be able to answer these questions. Uh, you just need to know the general concepts behind some of these, and you will need to be able to remember which ones are autosomal recessive versus dominant, etc. And so we can see that the way these questions are asked, um, experimental techniques, and we'll, we'll try to introduce what those techniques are. Some of you have worked in a lab before, you may know some of them, but uh, it is important to be able to uh, understand what kinds of experimental te techniques are used um, in studying genetics. Um, ten questions in the just the general areas of genetic mechanisms, um, all the way from things that you're familiar with, like transcriptional replication, um, and you'll see that as we go through these tech, uh, topics, we'll come up with new terms that uh, may be familiar to you or may not, but which are relatively important to know. Uh, 16 questions on risk assessment, so this is where we'll get into a little bit of math, uh, but in general what we're going to be trying to do here is use some fairly common um, techniques for calculating risk of transmission of uh, genetic uh, diseases from generation to generation, um, and finally recognition of clinical features, um, and this is an important concept of being able to know what are the characteristic findings for individuals with certain disorders. Okay, so let's start out and just think about the organization of the human genome. So I think probably everyone's very familiar with this, but let's just go through it in a little bit of detail. Uh, each diploid cell, and most of the cells in our bodies are diploid, ex exceptions obviously being the germ cells, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and this we now know is the same as other uh, hominids like the Neanderthals. So that is a characteristic of uh, the species that emerged um, well, probably several hundred thousand years ago um, with uh, Homo sapiens appearing in Africa um, around about 120, 150,000 years ago. Uh, of those 23 pairs of chromosomes, they're made up of 24 unique chromosomes. That's a little bit of misleading because, of course, each chromosome is actually probably quite unique in and of itself but um, 22 of them are the autosomes, numbered 1 through 22, and two other sex chromosomes, either X or Y, and of course the sex of each individual depends on the uh, identity of those sex chromosomes. The haploid genome is 3 billion base pairs in length, which sounds like a big number, and of course once you have 3 billion base pairs to uh, sort through, you have to try to figure out what they all do, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, the well, most important point really is that the expressed part of that genome in terms of the part that's made up of, ge of uh, genes is actually a fairly small proportion. We'll see that in a second. Our closest living relatives and the apes, uh, uh, they have 24 pairs of chromosomes. And so this asks the question of what the common ancestor of apes and humans, what their genome would have looked like. Um, and we assume that that individual or that species actually had 24 pairs of chromosomes and the evidence is that if we look at the uh, chromosome, human chromosome 2, we find that it appears to have resulted from the fusion of two er chromosomes from an earlier common ancestor. And we know this because we can find um, ancestral um, evidence of telomeres and centromeres from, that, uh, from two, two different chromosomes. And in fact, if you line up the human and the ape genome, uh, you can actually sort of trace that natural, his, natural history, although it is important to recognize that chromosomes change quite dramatically over time, so it's not a direct uh, uh, relationship. And there's a YouTube video there if you're, if you're interested in uh, 
following up on that particular uh, topic. Uh, so what is the genome made up of? So uh, remarkably, and uh, I think to a certain extent uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, a very small proportion. Uh, most people say less than 2%. This diagram from uh, a textbook from Garland Science shows 1.1% of the genome is made up of protein coding genes with another fairly reasonable 4% made up of ribosomal or of, of RNA genes, including ribosomal RNA genes. So genes that are only transcribed into RNA and then not into, uh, into protein. 45% um, or almost half of the genome is made up of repetitive sequences, probably the ancestral uh, heritage of lots of different infectious events that occurred earlier on in uh, human and, and pre-human um, evolution. Um, about 6.5% of the genome is referred to as heterochromatin, i.e. it is constitutively heterochromatin. This is highly con condensed, uh, generally inactive chromatin, often around sp structures like the centromere uh, and in some cases the telomere. Um, and so uh, thought to be protective um, uh, modification for the genome. Um, the opposite of heterochromatin is euchromatin, so we would generally consider that uh, all of the expressed genome is made up of euchromatin. And then 44% or so, which is others. So what we're going to talk about there is regulatory sequences, uh, structural elements that may be important for maintaining uh, chromosome position, say, for example, within the nucleus. Um, but as you can see, a vanishing or fairly small portion of the chromosome is what we really think of as the true business um, of the, of the genome, uh, business um, part of the, of the, uh, of the genome. Um, in genetics, we often like to look at chromosomes and ask what are they, uh, what are they actually doing? So here we have both a idealized um, diagram of a chromosome um, and then a fairly standard karyotype. So what we see here is chromosomes isolated from a metaphase cell. Um, they don't get popped out of the nucleus like this, in this beautiful order. This is the skill of cytogeneticists. And they stain them, and you can see this banding um, pattern where the darker stain uh, regions uh, tend to be regions of heterochromatin and the lighter stained are those of uh, euchromatin. Um, and so we can see the general um, nomenclature for chromosomes where we have two arms sep separated by the centromere. The P arm, P standing for petite, which is the French for small, and Q because it's the letter that comes after P. Um, and then the banding structure is based on um, the various different um, uh, banding, banding patterns. And so we could see that a P112 band will be around about here. And those, so there are naming um, systems for these. Not, not that critical anymore because nowadays we can quite easily uh, sequence much of the genome. Um, but looking at karyotypes will be something we will do throughout this course. Now, I want you to notice that the chromosomes are different lengths, they're different shapes, uh, they are uh, different pattern, banding, or banding patterns, um, the X chromosome much larger than the Y chromosome, um, so there are clearly some major differences between these chromosomes. Now, within those, um, uh, those chromosomes, of course, uh, you're familiar with the concept of uh, condensing, uh, or uncondensing chro uh, chromatin. So chromatin is simply the DNA um, intertwined and, and wrapped around uh, nucleosomes, which are made up of histones. And uh, depending on the phase of the cell cycle, uh, different regions of chromosomes may be fairly unwound, although never in this naked form. They're always going to be, at least the nuclear chromosomes, are always going to be protected, and that's what the nucleosomes tend to do. Um, and so there are multiple levels of uh, chromatin structure. Within uh, these chromosomes are distributed uh, between 20 and 25,000 functional units or genes, and we'll talk a little bit about what genes mean in just a second. Um, and that includes everything from those that encode messenger RNA, uh, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, um, and some of the more recent, although now getting fairly old, other types of RNAs like small nuclear or small nucleolar RNAs, which are involved in splicing, and microRNAs, which are involved often in uh, translational control uh, by uh, repressing uh, 
translation of messenger RNAs. But again, gene units, at least those that are protein encoding, uh, contribute a very small part of the, um, of the human genome. So um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have chromosomes of different sizes. Um, it's also true that the structures can change. Um, so here we see a chromosome, and it's chromosome 3, where the centromere is uh, located almost in the middle of the chromosome, so meta for middle. Um, and so we can see this, the centromere, this is where the spindle, or, or structure called the kinetochore, will assemble during replication, and microfilm, microtubules coming as filaments from this a new a spindle will attach here and then separate uh, chromosomes during replication. A submetacentric is a, another class of chromosomes. You can see that uh, here's chromosome 10. The centromere is located a little bit closer to one end. Uh, again, remember the short arm, petite. So the P arm is the shorter arm. Um, and then the shortest, and um, well, not all shortest, but shorter chromosomes are often acrocentric, meaning that the centromere is located very close to one end. You can see it here. There's just a small P arm. Um, on all of these acrocentric chromosomes, except for the Y chromosome, we have what are called what are um, tandemly repeated ribosomal RNA genes, making up the um, majority of the P arm. Uh, these are the genes which will um, express ribosomal RNA. Um, one of the things why that's important is we will talk about these kinds of chromosomes quite a lot. You'll notice Down, Down syndrome is caused by trisomy 21, so 21 is one of the acrocentric chromosomes. And, and this is going to be important because you'll, know, you'll find that we can actually lose some of these short arms of these chromosomes with relatively little um, impact on the, on the cell and on the individual, simply because there are so many of these tandemly repeated ribosomal RNA genes. Okay, so um, we can look at chromosomes in any, any um, different ways. This is just a different way of looking at the different classes of chromosomes, which are structure organized either based on length or based on centromere pos position. Um, I'll just point out one thing, which uh, there was a mistake really made at the very beginning of chromosome uh, characterization, uh, where they actually mis- or um, mismeasured the length of chromosomes 21 and 22. They originally thought 22 is the shortest uh, autosome. Um, in fact, 21 is, but um, no one went back and changed it. So you can sort of see uh, that in terms of the relative length. These are just relative lengths. Uh, the chromosomes themselves also differ in a variety of other ways. Uh, here we see a, a little bit of an older diagram, but it just gives, it tells the story that I want, which is that you can see on the top of each of these is a number. This is the relative number of, of genes that have been characterized on each of these chromosomes. And in general, you'll notice that there's more genes on the longer chromosomes and less genes on some of the shorter chromosomes. But uh, one thing I really want, to no want you to notice is that some chromosomes are actually fairly gene poor. And I'm going to point out three of these. You'll notice that chromosome 13 is a relatively gene poor. You can see that it has mm, almost a quarter of the number of genes that chromosome 14 has. Chromosome 18 only has roughly 12 more. There's probably more now. Um, and chromosome uh, 21 has 386. The um, reason I highlight these three chromosomes is these are the three chromosomes that are associated with live birth uh, trisomies. Um, and probably the reason why there is um, the possibility of live birth of individuals with trisomies of these three chromosomes has something to do with the um, relative number of genes. In other words, you're not triplicating um, as many genes as you would in, in some of these other cases, because in fact, you can in theory have trisomies of all of these, it's just they don't result in usually in live births. So, um, it is important to remember a little bit about the structure of genes because you'll often get asked questions about the impact of genetic mutations that impact or that occur within different regions of genes. Here's a very simplis simplified version of a um, uh, messenger RNA encoding or protein encoding gene, uh, which you'll recall is 
uh, transcribed um, in humans by RNA polymerase 2, RNA pol 1 transcribing uh, ribosomal RNAs, and RNA pol 3 transcribing tRNAs. Um, in general, what will happen is transcription will initiate in a region called a promoter. Uh, there's going to be other regions outside of this, uh, enhancers and silencers, which can modulate the level of transcription, but transcription uh, initiates within the promoter, uh, and that initiation event involves the recruitment of the polymerase by general transcription factors um, to initiate transcription. Uh, this um, diagram shows uh, introns and exons, and you can, although not all uh, human genes have uh, actually have introns or, or interrupted genes, in general those that do the introns tend to be longer than the exons, so much of the actual gene structure is itself not uh, processed into mature messenger RNAs. So these are initially transcribed into heterogeneous nuclear RNAs uh, that include untranslated regions, exons and introns, and then the process of splicing will remove the introns to yield a final mature uh, messenger RNA, which is accurately spliced, is capped with a 5-methyl guanosine cap, and usually is poly polyadenylated. And polyadenylation is an important modification that allows for transport of messenger RNA out of the nucleus to be translated by uh, ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Um, it's also critical to remember that regulation can occur at all stages of uh, gene expression, at the level of transcription, whether that be initiation or elongation. Um, in terms of processing, so you can regulate the processing and the transport of RNAs uh, out of the nucleus. Uh, as I talked about last year in the area of translation, this is a highly regulated process. In fact, perhaps the most important uh, por uh, step in gene, re gene expression that is regulated. And of course, proteins themselves can be regulated by processing um, secondary modifications and also by degradation. And so it will be important to remember what the consequences of mutations, say in a promoter versus in a splice site, um, might have on the um, synthesis of mature or um, uh, non-functional mes uh, messenger RNAs. Um, and so in terms of studying genetics, we're always trying to understand what is the uh, origin of variation within the population. And in fact, there have been those who've asked, um, are humans still evolving? That's been a question I've been asked multiple times and I've seen being asked. You need two things for uh, evolution or natural selection to continue to work. And one is um, the existence of variation. And there is tremendous variation um, amongst human populations, although not as much as um, occurs in, in other species, mainly because humans went through a fairly major uh, bottleneck um, at the last ice age. So the population dropped quite dramatically. And we'll talk about that kind of concept and founder effects a little bit later. Um, but once you have variation and you have differences in uh, reproductive success, you have the potential for natural selection to occur. So genetic variation, um, we know that the human population is not homogeneous. Um, subpopulations have, have emerged over time based on the um, pattern of set settling of different populations as they have migrated uh, first out of Africa and then across the rest of the world so that humans pretty much live on all continents now. Um, and there are certain uh, genetic patterns which are seen more commonly in um, different populations that have emerged over that time. And we'll talk about that concept um, much later, particularly when we talk about um, the relative frequency of different diseases within ethnic or other groups, um, and also in terms of how we calculate risk by knowing something about the um, his natural history of an individual in his family or her family. Um, so we know the populations are quite, can be quite isolated, and that certainly happened over time. Nowadays, of course, there is much less potential for, or much more potential for mixing of different populations. But if we go back only 500 years, the average human being uh, didn't migrate more than 20 miles from the point where they were born to the point where they died. So uh, there wasn't that much uh, mixing of populations. Although, of course, some individuals tra tra traveled and spread their, uh, spread their genes around as freely as they could, I guess, in some cases. 
Um, so population isolation can certainly lead to the accumulation of disease-associated alleles. And um, we'll talk about these, uh, the most important being uh, the concept of random genetic drift. Uh, and we'll talk about very specific examples where that's occurred in human population. The most general and most commonly uh, studied is that co one called the founder effect. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and then population isolation uh, can result in differential frequencies of individual genetic diseases. And you're probably familiar with the fact that there are certain diseases that are more common in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish background, uh, Finns, the Finnish, uh, and because of both the founder effect and then of, of um, uh, geographic isolation um, are another example of a population with more common occurrence of certain diseases than would be expected. This is a diagram which just shows a little bit, and for those of you who are interested in the, the natural history of the human population, we see that uh, humans originated um, around about the uh, Rift Valley in uh, modern-day Ethiopia. That's where our first, uh, his first evidence of human populations. And then they migrated out of there. The first humans actually migrated and crossed la uh, land bridges that existed at that time uh, down towards uh, um, Australia. Um, and subsequent populations settled um, in, the, in Asia and then moved either eastward, eventually crossing the Bering Straits and into North America and South America, uh, while other populations headed uh, west and uh, got into population, populating Europe. And of course, these individuals who populated Europe, again, some of them moved, migrated across the ocean and uh, came in contact with these uh, other populations which had settled in North and South America. And we can trace the history, the natural history of these populations by looking at their genetic information. Uh, I just thought I'd show mine. This is, uh, this is from 23andMe. This is a diagram showing um, my uh, paternal ancestry, which is traced using Y chromosomes, because Y chromosomes don't actually um, change very much from generation to generation. We'll see why that is on uh, Tuesday. Uh, and you can see that my uh, uh, Y chromosome markers on my Y chromosome really um, are most commonly found in southern France and in the Basque region of um, Spain. Um, and eventually these populations migrated into southern Ireland, which is that little blob there, and that's where I entered the story. Um, and we can trace our mater maternal history by um, following the mitochondrial chromosomes. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. So what kinds of mutations and what kinds of changes are we looking at? So um, point mutations are probably the simplest to um, understand, where single base changes. Uh, in theory, any position in the genome can be changed to any of the other three bases. So there's almost, not quite, but almost an, a, um, uh, an, Im an immense or um, huge amount of vari possible variation. Uh, we can have missense mutations where the change occurs in a codon and may lead to a change in the identity of the codon, and we'll see some examples of that, achondroplasia, which is genetic dwarfism, and sickle cell anemia. Uh, we can have nonsense mutations, i.e. changing a codon to a termination codon. You remember we talked about these kinds of things um, a while back, and one cause of cystic fibrosis, which is a disease which shows tremendous allelic heterogeneity. Um, the C1609T mutation uh, introduces a stop codon, and a stop codon will cause premature termination of sequence. Uh, we can obviously have silent mutations, so there are many times when a change, um, even if it's within a coding sequence, may not result in the change of genetic code. Um, and of course, we can have mutations that occur outside coding sequences, um, in promoters or in other types of control regions, which may impact, say, transcription, translation, or even chromosome structure. Insertions and deletions uh, can occur in a variety of different uh, uh, diseases. The most common mutation that's seen in cystic fibrosis, and we will spend a fair bit of time talking about CF, is called the delta F508 deletion. That means that there is a delta, a deletion of the codon for phenylalanine that occurs at position 508 of the CFTR protein. Uh, 
uh, and that single mutation, which is a three base deletion, you remember if we think about reading frames, that won't throw the protein out of reading frame, but does cause changes in the processing of that protein. The most common, uh, that's the most common mutation associated with 70% of cases of CF in Europe. Uh, we can see, um, and we'll see these tomorrow, um, or tomorrow, Tuesday, triplet expansion disorders, um, and we'll talk about diseases like fragile X syndrome and Huntington's disease, where the location of the expansion, whether it's in the coding sequence or in control regions, can have a significant impact on the um, either the expression or the function of particular genes. And then when we talk about genomic imprinting, we'll talk about the chromosome 15 deletions, which are associated with two very different um, disorders, Prader-Willi or Angelman syndromes, but which remarkably are caused by essentially the same deletion. Just depends on whether those occur in the uh, maternal or paternal chromosome. And we'll talk about that in our uh, genomic imprinting section. And then we got translocations and uh, other deletions, so larger deletions. Um, so we'll talk um, today, on, on Monday, about translocation down syndrome. So a different version or a different form of trisomy where an individual can have an apparent normal chromosome number, but have a translocation which contributes an additional copy of chromosome 21. Um, when we talk about uh, the genetics of cancer a little bit later in the course, uh, we'll, uh, one of the examples will be uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a translocation which um, exchanges information between chromosomes 9 and 22, and we'll talk about that, what that means. And then two of the most common um, deletion syndromes, Williams and George syndrome, which we'll talk about tomorrow or on Monday. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to do in terms of our, our overview. I hope that most of this has been entirely review. Maybe it's reminded you of things that you um, might have forgotten. Um, I know it might, it's been a while since you covered much of this material, but so long as you can sort of keep this material um, in mind, this will set you up, I think, nicely for the um, sessions that we'll cover over the next couple of days. And my goal is to, rather than talking about these sort of general background concepts, is to give much of these general background ideas in these pre-videos, and then spend more of our time in, in sessions talking about the kinds of disorders and reasoning through why they exist or why, our, why risk assessment might be done in certain ways. Okay, well, thanks for listening, and I look forward to seeing you in class.